final talk before lunch, which I'm sure you are all excited for. Um, we actually had to do a little bit of a switch up. Um, uh, the speaker who is scheduled for this point right now, um, Keenan Cummings, actually called in sick, unfortunately. So um, I really want you guys to, uh, you know, put it together uh, for Cindy Barber, who volunteered with less than 24 hours notice. Um, yeah. Uh, she is a uh, local business owner here in Cleveland. She started the Beachland Ballroom, which is a music venue. Uh, she's been in business for 15 years, and so she's going to talk about uh, starting from scratch with nothing in a neighborhood that had nothing, <laughs> um, and building culture, and what that's done for Cleveland as a whole. And also, um, I Googled her and discovered that in 2007, she won the Martha Joseph Prize for Distinguished Service to the Arts. So, very inspiring. Thank you guys so much. Welcome, Cindy. <laughs> All right. Well, given the short notice, I don't have any fancy slides or a planned presentation. So, I'm hoping that we can just sort of do this almost as a Q&A after I give you uh, some background on what happened in the North Collinwood neighborhood, which is much like this neighborhood. Um, and how many of you are entrepreneurs starting your own business, kind of trying to survive? Lots of you, lots of you. Um, well, in some ways, I took my inspiration from this neighborhood um, and this building because uh, James Levin started um, Cleveland Public Theater in the late 70s and was doing a lot of really weird experimental theater. Um, he had been to New York and uh, this was a really rundown neighborhood. Um, and he went in here and rented at first and then like started a nonprofit um, and very slowly built this up. Uh, in some ways, this is just now in the last three years become a real neighborhood where there's um, stores and shops and other entrepreneurs joining him. But um, I kind of took my uh, inspiration from James and he was doing theater over here, so I wanted to do music over on the um, east side of town. I had come to my neighborhood, which is right on the lake. We're very lucky in Cleveland to have a lot of lakefront access. And in the 80s, I uh, visited a friend of mine and found this little cottage right on a cliff overlooking Lake Erie where you could see sunsets every night. And I said, oh, I'm staying here. I don't have to move back to L.A. or Colorado or some other place. I can really root down in Cleveland right now. At the time, um, I was doing freelance graphics and design work. Um, so I come from a background of, of a lot of what you all do. And I was a writer at the time. Um, in the 70s, I had an underground newspaper that we ran out of the basement of my house um, covering para ubu and uh, styrenes and electric eels and things like that that were happening here in Cleveland at the time. Um, and then I went on in the 90s to uh, become the editor of our, our alternative newspaper called The Free Times, uh, much like the Austin Chronicle, the Chicago Reader, um, we started out in 1992, and I was the editor for uh, six years there. I was on the national board of the Alternative News Weeklies and um, watched as that industry sort of got corporatized and was co-opted by a bunch of very selfish rich people <laughs> um, who started buying up newspapers in, in um, other parts of the city, I mean, the country. There was actually a... Um, a uh, map of the United States in Phoenix that the uh, libertarians were the owners of the Phoenix New Times and they were targeting cities that they were going after and going in and buying up newspapers and chaining them. Um, and uh, ultimately it became a war and um, the Village Voice became the alternative to the New Times and they were supposed to be the liberals and keep the voice of uh, free press alive. And so they started, in defense, people started getting them to buy up their papers. So there became these like two papers in every city. One was owned by the Village Voice and one was owned by the New Times chain. Um, and it became very destructive for uh, local uh, media and local voices 
in cities. The only thing, the only papers that have really survived that, um, I believe, are the Austin Chronicle, uh, Toronto Now, um, Willamette Week in Portland. Very few have survived that. Um, but in 1998, um, they, it became like a really big war, and they decided to go in a different direction, and basically I got canned um, from the Village Voice uh, as the editor of the Free Times in Cleveland. But they gave me a year's salary basically to leave and be quiet um, <laughs> and not compete. Um, and somebody offered me a job in Pittsburgh as the editor of the Pittsburgh paper, and I just decided, you know, I am so in love with Cleveland that I can't leave the city. Um, so what do I do now? And I looked around at my neighborhood, and when I moved to North Collinwood, it, it has a lot of music history. It's the city, it's the, the neighborhood where Frankie Yankovic grew up. Um, he's the polka king of Cleveland. He had the first pop polka hit in the mid-50s. Um, and a lot of the garage rock bands in the 60s started in my neighborhood, too. So I decided, you know what, there's not um, enough music venues right now, and one of the main music venues downtown was sort of running into tax problems. So I thought, uh, I'm going to look at the Croatian Hall. There's an old Croatian Hall that was for sale um, in right around the corner from my house. Um, and I had to get a friend who spoke Croatian to go in with me so that we could talk to the people that were in charge. And it was a very weird building. Um, they had uh, pictures of Adolf Hitler on the wall. Um, the Croatians historically were um, part of the SS in um, World War II. So these were people who had like nailed the door shut so that no African-American patrons could enter the building. Um, and they were really paranoid. And the Croatians were fleeing um, neighborhoods in Cleveland like crazy for the suburbs um, as neighborhoods got more diversified. And there was a lot of um, uh, blockbusting uh, going on in my neighborhood. Um, so I wanted to kind of make a statement and uh, say we can uh, create a destination location for a neighborhood and we'll get traffic there um, because there was a lot of prostitution and street drug dealing going on. Um, so I took my $50,000 that I had from uh, the buyout of the Free Times and I looked around for a partner and I found a friend who had been booking um, Detroit garage rock bands in a really funky little roadhouse bar down in the flats called Pats in the Flats. Um, and he would brought in, I when I was running the newspaper, I'd written about what he'd been doing. Because he brought in the White Stripes and uh, uh, the Green Horns, uh, lots of really cool um, Detroit bands, and he was maxing out. And he wasn't making any money because the um, they were only getting the door and they couldn't get the bar from this place. So he joined me and we became a couple. So we sold his house and took the money from his um, sale of his house and we managed to try to write a business plan to buy the Croatian Hall, which was, I think at the time, uh, $150,000, something like that. And it's a 10,000 square foot building this is the front of it now. Um, there's two rooms. There's a, a room about this size. It's a 500 capacity room, and then there's a bar that's 150 capacity. Um, so we sat and wrote a business plan. We tried to talk to bankers, and nobody would deal with us. No one. They were like, why do you want to go into that neighborhood and start a music venue? That's crazy. Nobody's going to go there. Because um, everything traditionally had been in the flats and had been centered in downtown. And, and the powers that be at the time really didn't believe in neighborhood development very much. Um, a lot of the um, historic neighborhood development organizations here were more used to doing neighborhood organization um, for housing and not a lot of business development. Um, so we tried 
to get um, a bank loan and failed. So we just opened. We just took over the Croatian hall. We threw up a sign and said, this is the Beachland and the Croatians let us start booking shows. So we took the little postcard um, format that they'd done at Pats in the Flats and sat at a little booth and put our labels on postcards and sent out our first uh, list of shows. Um, and the White Stripes played the first Saturday night in our tavern. We hadn't even built a stage. They played on the floor. Um, and we documented every person that came in, which zip code they came from, and how much money they spent that night, how much money we made. Um, and we eventually found, it took us, I don't know, another six months. I think we opened in March, and we finally found a friend. And, and it was all about um, knowing somebody, because I finally found an old friend who worked in community banking at Key Bank who pushed this through for us and got us an SBA loan. Um, you know, they took my house as a uh, collateral and um, actually I had two houses that I had at the time um, as collateral, but um, we managed to get the loan for the, ba for the building plus a, um, a small, a very small uh, overrun to do some uh, rehab on it, right? We needed to. At first we rented um, a sound system Gary's, uh, who's back there, Vertical Sound was her first sound company. Um, and we had to rent that um, every night, which was very expensive. Um, and kind of piece together a way to put a business together. Um, I thought at the time, very naively, oh, we're going to open this business and everybody will follow. And there will be shops here. Um, we have an old uh, Coventry, which is up in Cleveland Heights, was a kind of the old hippie place where, you know, there was a record store and an, a sound equipment store and a juice bar and stuff like that. And I thought that's what's going to happen right away. Um, well, it's taken, we're now about 15 years old. Um, we're, we'll be 15 in, um, in March. Uh, and it's taken that long to kind of have that vision become um, a reality. Um, in between, we, it was, you know, it was just Mark and myself doing this, so, uh, you know, I remember one time we had to book Los Lobos, um, so that's a, that's a $10,000 guarantee for a band. So I had to borrow $5,000 from a friend to send in a deposit so that we could, we could put on that show. Um, you know, in another instance, we were, like, really struggling with cash flow, and two um, patrons guaranteed put a CD that they had um, at a bank and guaranteed so we could get overdraft protection. Um, getting financing is really difficult and um, if I can impart anything, uh, it would be that, you know, we militantly need to change the way that the arts are funded um, with everybody putting their money into 401ks and it all going into Wall Street and to international companies. There really needs to be a movement to change that, you know, to get investment back into the communities and, and save money. Um, if you can, if you're young, come up with a way to create your own investment plan and create your own bank. <laughs> That's really what we need in this country. Um, <laughs> We do have a really um, progressive development corporation in my neighborhood, though, and I want to kind of give you the scoop on what they've done. Um, and Cleveland has really risen in the last decade to kind of becoming a forerunner in how to get the arts funded. Um, probably three years after we had started the Beachland, um, we got a new development director at uh, Northeast Shores Development Corporation. And what um, we did then uh, through the Development Corporation, I joined the board and became very active um, in the neighborhood. Uh, there was an, an old barbershop uh, that was like two doors down from the Beachland 
that was in foreclosure, and it was really cheap. It was like $20,000, and this guy was walking away from it. So one day, two young um, graduates from college came wandering in and said, we want to open a music store next to a venue, and we want to be right next to you. Um, so they also had to go through the whole same business plan. They like came every night and interviewed Beachland customers. Would you come to a music store that was next to a venue? But the Development Corporation bought the, um, the old barber shop for them and set up a payment plan so that um, they paid a rent and a portion of that rent went to um, a, a holding amount that would then become a down payment for, their, for them to own the property. So within a year, they went, were able to go back to the bank, they'd saved, the development corporation had automatically saved this money, and they were able to purchase this property, and they're still going now. It's, uh, you know, I think they just celebrated their 10th year music saves, which, yeah. <laughs> And they've been recognized uh, nationally and internationally. They do like uh, you know concerts in the uh, in the room in their little uh, storefront before our shows, and we work cooperatively with them. Um, and it's sort of the theme, you know. I've, I've kind of adopted "Music Saves" as the uh, Waterloo uh, slogan, um, and all of us have. Uh, uh, what's happened since then is that um, more people have purchased property and rehabbed it very carefully and own their own buildings. That's what we want. Um, there's another record store that opened down the street called Blue Arrow. They do vinyl, um, vintage vinyl, and they're our partners. We also have a vintage store in the basement of the Beachland, so those people are our partners. There's a nonprofit that opened, um, took, bought a building, um, the Waterloo Arts, and they have a gallery. We now have five galleries on the street. Um, we are in the middle of a $5.5 million streetscape that was able to be leveraged because of the beach land and because we've started to redo everything over there. The development director, Brian Friedman, has been able to kind of tout um, the beach land and music saves and some of the other little um, entrepreneurs on the street as, you know, reorganizing the neighborhood through the arts. So he very smartly wrote um, a grant to uh, the Ford Foundation and the Kresge Foundation, and we were able to um, create a, a move to Waterloo, if you're an artist, kind of um, offer. So they, f they offered people nationally, they advertised and brought people in probably 30 to 40 people came and visited Waterloo to see if they wanted to buy a house there and become part of the neighborhood, and some of them have, um, and we're actively doing that. And he also got a grant called the Lotus Project, so there's nine houses that are being offered for $20,000 to people to then repurpose those into an art project. Saigote Press, which is uh, much like the poster art, they have, uh, they're gonna open up a poster art um, facility, hoping that bands and p artists can use that facility so that they can make touring posters. Um, and then Lauren Naji, who's been in the news here lately as um, a troublemaker because he served wine at an art opening. Um, and had bands playing, he got arrested, and it's a big controversy that we're all going through right now. Um, but Lauren's opening a satellite studio up there, and we're, uh, we're opening a um, museum for Reverend Albert Wagner, who is a really uh, renowned outside artist in the African-American muni community here, really naive, wonderful stuff. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, I would invite all of you to come and maybe be part of that if you're looking for an opportunity. Uh, the Development Corporation is one by one trying to rehab these buildings and uh, turn this into, a, you know, a very arts-based neighborhood. And we're trying to be very careful about not it letting it be too gentrified, um, that we want people to own it. It's a little teetering right now because we've gotten a lot of press and we don't want that big, you know, money investor coming in and then 
having high rents, you know, where it's like $21 a square foot. It's not practical. We want really uh, talented entrepreneurs to be part of our little community over there. Um, and to that end, I started a nonprofit called Cleveland Rocks, um, Past, Present, and Future, and the Development Corporation was able to help me get funding for that. And we started a, um, a rock and roll photograph gallery next to the Beachland, and I'm now in the middle of um, trying to get funding. I got funding from the OAC, which is the Ohio Arts Council, and we're going after um, Cuyahoga Arts and Culture uh, grant to help me work with Tri-C to take, we're gonna take four bands and we're gonna document what their economic needs are and how we could help them become, you know, another Black Keys. We got the Black Keys started at the Beachland. They did their first show there and then I helped them get their first manager and their first booking agent. So, but they moved to Nashville and they're producing records out of Nashville. But, you know, my goal is that the next Black Keys to come out of Cleveland um, should set up uh, a base here and we should rise and look back and pull the next person to the, to the forefront. And one of the prime examples of somebody moving to the neighborhood and being a musician is Dolfish, who's playing outside. Um, Max bought a house in my neighborhood for $22,000. Um, he had moved back from Brooklyn and he's really excited about having the opportunity because now he can afford to tour because it's so cheap to live in Cleveland. <laughs> so if you don't live here, move here. <laughs> and, um, and then the other thing I just wanted to add too is that I know that the, I'm really happy that you guys are doing this race panel because obviously that is really needed right now. And that's the other thing I'm trying to make sure. My neighborhood is really diverse and I really don't want the native people to be, you know, out, moved out. Um, and there's a lot of um, really uh, smart programs that are starting to develop in Cleveland to help um, get artists in the African-American community more integrated into the more mainstream. And I want to recommend that you go across the street to my friend um, Rafiq's um, bookstore called Guide to Culture. He is an amazing poet and um, militant spokesman. Uh, go visit him, go talk to him. Uh, you will be rewarded. <laughs> uh, and and I, I don't know where else to go with this, so does anybody have any questions? First off, as a music lover, I just want to thank you for booking the bands that you book there. Um, you know, I think there's genres that are dying that can't find places to play, and those genres mean the most to me, and you let them play there. So that's, like, totally awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that is one thing that we um, take pride in is that, you know, my, Mark, my partner, is a garage rock um, historic person and soul music and we're trying to mine those um, cultures and make sure that people can um, can hear new and old of the, the old school genres. We're sort of retro. Is there a, a beach, uh, Beachland Ballroom like music conference coming? Yeah. <laughs> That would be interesting. Maybe I should talk to these guys about, uh, about that. I mean, Todd and Jeff were effective at getting me to speak here, so maybe I can get them to come over and put that together. <laughs> um, well, I just have a comment about uh, when you're talking about uh, how this is like a really respectful way to gentrify an area that has you know, gone through some really hard times. I think that, I mean, speaking from where I live in Chicago in a neighborhood that's like, really trying to figure that out and having a hard time. Um, and, you know, it's happening in San Francisco, it's happening in, you know, New York. So um, I just don't think there's enough conversation happening or models for people actually doing that in a way successful and respectful and, and you know, everyone gets to kind of be a part of that. So um, thank you for bringing that up. It's awesome. It, it, it has to a lot to do with the city of Cleveland and, and they really have um, kind of woken up um, they have some pretty progressive people in the economic development department, finally. Um, so, 
it's starting to happen. Hi. Um, as a also female business owner, I was just curious if you could talk about a couple of things that you might have ran into and overcame um, as being a female in charge. <laughs> a lot of it has to do with my own personal um, sense of worth, like overcoming that. Because, you know, I, and, and Margo was glad, I think, that um, I'm a little bit older in talking to you guys because I grew up in a time when, you know, you weren't allowed to do anything, basically. I mean, you were being raised to be a housewife, um, and going to college was a big deal. Um, and I had to pay my own way to get through school. And I worked at, I, you know, I was fortunate to grow up in the late 60s, early 70s here when there was this amazing music culture. So I became like a clerk, you know, taking orders in the warehouse for MCA and ABC and um, Warner Brothers. Uh, but I, I, you weren't allowed to, like, you, I had a brain and I knew music and I knew what I wanted. But I couldn't be a promotion person. I wasn't allowed. And I wasn't allowed to be a salesperson. So in some ways, I was trained, you know, to think that way. And it was almost became a fight with myself to go, you can do this. You can make this happen. And I still have those moments where there, it's tough. And I don't want to have to deal with, you know, I mean, we had this controversy here where, um, the admission tax, I don't know if any of you saw that, but um, the city of Cleveland decided in 2009 that they weren't collecting all of the admission tax that they could, and they started going after really small venues. And they, um, I'm like, I don't have the money to pay you. You know, they, they wanted $150,000, and I don't have that. So I had to, I like buried my head. It was really scary, and I needed, I needed help. And uh, there was a coalition of people who came together and uh, helped get me through that. But I mean, and that's, uh, community is so important. And we have really built a community here of music people and artists and everybody is got each other's back. I mean, I just talked to Matt Zone last night, who's the councilman here, who is um, gonna chair a, a meeting next week to try to help Lauren Naji with this um, accusation that he's had. And he's been going through the same thing where he's been scared because you're an artist and you feel like you're not capable. Um, so I think it's that, that, to me, that's the biggest thing. Um, you know, I do, I, I don't have, uh, and I, I don't have a lot of um, time to um, like have a peer group of other women that are doing things, and I regret that. Hi, thank you for your, informa or your information and insight. Maybe you could talk to some of these guys and gals who want to uh, start a design business or ad business or whatever it is to talk about the struggles of partnership, um, bootstrapping, and that sort of thing. Say that again. The struggles of, of being in a partnership, of starting a business with another person, and, oh, yeah. and bootstrapping. Right. Well, working in partnership um, is always a compromise. I mean, um, my partner Mark and I, uh, event, we, we lived together for 10 years, but eventually I had to move out because all we did was talk about the business. <laughs> It was really difficult, and we were, you know, um, struggling. And we had different, we have differences of opinion. And the reality is, the beach and wouldn't work if there weren't both personalities. Because he's really tight, conservative. We can't do this. And I'm like, yeah, let's go to the moon. Um, but he, somehow we balance each other out. Um, but it's difficult, and it, and. Um, but I, but I do think that you need other people. There's no way that I could have done this business myself. I mean, we have grown from, you know, like a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to over $2 million 
um, in 15 years. And, um, you know, I kind of ended up taking on a lot of the money processes. Mark ended up, we were doing booking together um, for a while because I'm like a really big Americana and folky kind of person. And we were like kind of arguing about, no, I want that date. No, I want that date. <laughs> um, so I ended up like kind of giving that over to him. Um, and he just sits at his computer all day and like talks to booking agents. Um, I mean, the one thing that I'm hoping that will, will happen for the Beachland is, is that we can collaborate with designers. You know, we do, we've, been, you know, we've helped um, poster artists at the Beachland. Um, Sean Carroll from uh, Sandusky Designs started out at the Beachland and ended up, you know, in Flatstock, and his posters are going online for hundreds of um, dollars and thousands of dollars, and the re really rare ones. Um, John Hicks, who's in um, the show upstairs, um, there's an Oneida poster he did not very long ago, but um, he works for the Beachland, and um, I'm hoping that there's more. I mean, one of the things that I'd like to be able to do is to help fund that industry um, a little bit more through a coalition of clubs here, and that would be part of what the future should look like in Cleveland. Um, any last ones? We have maybe time for one more. No? Okay. Thank you so much, Cindy. <laughs>